and the chef will not give me the time of day. I mean, he is just totally he's like, oh god, another couple Americans, you know, forget it. Uh, could not be bothered. I'm trying to ordering directly with him, you know, it's like, menu, you know, menu, I'm busy, menu. You know, so I look at the menu, I try to, and this is all being recorded on tape, right? So my credibility is totally on the line here. This is going to get broadcast to all of LA and PR. Uh, so I'm like, oh, so I'm trying to, how do I get the chef to pay attention to me? And um, so, you know, I tried ordering a few of the more traditional, you know, sushi fish as opposed to the more popular ones in the U.S. And he's kind of like, yeah, whatever, man. And he like takes a sheet. Then I said, excuse me, could you pack the, the sushi, the nigiri, together loosely? And nigiri, if you don't know, are the little packs of fish, uh, the little packs of rice with the fish on it, right? Could you pack it loosely? Stops dead in his tracks. He's like, huh? Could you pack the sushi loosely, not hard, right? Usually you pack it together really hard for Americans. Could you pack it loose like for a Japanese person? Okay, I make you sushi, yeah! And he started calling out like all his secret boxes of special ingredients, you know, and like the best fish that was flown in from Tokyo yesterday, you know, that he wasn't going to give me. Like, totally ignored all the order stuff I put in. Like, did not care what I had wanted to order at that point. And he just started dishing out one after another this amazing meal of all the stuff. It's like, best thing for today. You're getting the best thing for today. And it was, and the reporter I was with, which is like totally blown away. And he was kind of, he's like, I'm getting this on tape. Okay, <laughs> it's really happening, you know. Um, and the, the point is that that was like a little etiquette thing, very simple thing that I knew enough to say to get his attention, like, oh, this is an educated sushi eater. I can treat this person like a Japanese person, which is to say someone who knows the history of sushi, or, you know, how sushi is supposed to be in that part. Why does it matter whether the sushi is packed together loosely? Well, that brings us to point number two. Um, uh, the, the sushi should actually fall apart in your mouth. So the best sushi chefs are actually, their technique is years and years of practice getting the sushi to hold together just long enough for it to get in your mouth. So actually, it should get in your mouth and fall apart. The grains of rice, mixing, mingling with the fish into this very succulent, kind of, not quite melty, but you know, fall apart, you can test it, you can feel the different grains of rice in your mouth, all this kind of stuff. So that's what a good nigiri should be. And 99% of the nigiri served in the United States are not that way, because Here's another, point number three we're on now. Americans generally think we're supposed to eat the sushi with chopsticks. Is, right, Japanese people eat everything with chopsticks. Well, actually, I learned that serious sushi aficionados eat with their fingers. They sit at the sushi bar and eat with their fingers. And that's because that way the nigiri can be really loose. You can get that wonderful all part of your mouth sensation going on. So a good sushi chef, he's, he's packing the rice tight around the edge. Inside, he's creating these little air pockets. It's very loose in there. And now I start talking to sushi chefs about their techniques and how they make it. And I was just blown away. I had no idea any of this was going on. But this is what their, you know, their technique is behind the scenes. So pick up with your fingers, gets in your mouth, falls apart. That's, that's what you want to be shooting for. So that's one way to convince a chef that you know, you're serious. You know what you're talking about. Make me some good Japanese-style sushi. Um, Okay, so next point, don't use extra wasabi and don't mix wasabi in your soy sauce. Here's another thing, we all do it, I did it, everybody does it, and chef after chef after chef that I talked to, they said, as soon as I see somebody mixing wasabi in their soy sauce, I automatically will not give that person my best fish. They're off the list for best fish, period. <laughs> and that's because he got up at 4.30 in the morning to go to the fish market to pick out the best fish and he wants people to taste it and the flavor differences between the best fish and the okay fish are pretty subtle. And so all that wasabi is actually blowing, you know, just the way when you have your sushi orgasm, you're having a wasabi orgasm, not a sushi orgasm. All that wasabi going up your nose, that's, that's what you're experiencing. So, you know, I didn't know this, but all the chefs, you know, roll in their eyes, but it's really sad because I know they're not going to be able to taste it. Um, so in fact, each chef is putting the right amount of wasabi in the sushi as he makes it. And I'm basically talking about nigiri, the old-fashioned Tokyo-style sushi, not so much rolls and stuff. That's like a whole other category, which is mostly American. Um, so when he makes the sushi, a little bit of wasabi inside the nigiri that he's making. And he's actually adjusting the amount of that wasabi for the particular fish. So he's putting exactly the right amount. And fish that are a little oilier, he's oilier, he's putting in more wasabi. 
uh, little, you know, leaner fish is putting in less wasabi. So, um, and, and the other, a little, I'm kind of a pop science geek, both in my books, The Secret Life of Lobsters, and the story of sushi have some fun, like, pop science stuff that I put in there, and one of the little pop science facts was, the chemistry is such, when you put wasabi in the soy sauce, actually a lot of the spiciness goes away as soon as you get immersed in liquid. So, you know, you're losing, actually, a lot of the spiciness of that. Um, and then, the next point, related to this, don't assume every piece of sushi should be dipped in soy sauce. Ask the chef. And in fact, uh, the best chefs actually season each piece of sushi perfectly for you the way they think it should be eaten before they give it to you at the sushi bar. No extra soy sauce is, is needed. And occasionally you encounter a chef who's really serious about educating the customer. He, he'll say over and over again, no, no soy sauce, no soy sauce. Because he's got these little special sauces and garnishes and stuff behind the sushi bar that he's putting on the, the, the nigiri before he hands it to you. Um, so that's another thing. Lots of soy sauce, again, you're probably not going to be getting the best fish. Um, and then finally, the pickled ginger. And uh, most, most of you probably know that, that that's a, a palate cleanser. It's, it's like a sorbet would be in Western cuisine. So between each piece of fish, a piece of pickled ginger cleanses the palate. It, it cuts through the oiliness. Again, different fish have different flavors, different oiliness. Too much oil on the previous fish can mask your ability to detect the flavor of a more subtle flavored fish that comes next. Um, so that's the story with the ginger. So those are the basic etiquette tips. And what I say to people, that's why, you know, instead of talking all about the history of sushi on the card or trying to, you know, give a sense of the book, I just actually wanted, like, these are very simple take-home things that actually, once you start practicing them, not because, you know, I want to be the sushi police and say, you know, this is the ancient Japanese etiquette, and this is the only way it can be done, and all that. That's not my point at all. I have no interest in, in trying to enforce, you know, authenticity. This is just, once you start doing these things, the sushi chef will notice, and he'll start making the sushi differently, and you'll get a very different, much more interesting experience. Uh, and the last thing I'll just say about that is that, um, I was mentioning several times the oiliness of fish. In the U.S., we've become very, um, interested in the very fatty cuts of fish. So the fish that we tend to associate as like the pinnacle of good sushi is like the very fatty belly cuts of tuna, fatty cuts of salmon, this whole melt in your mouth sensation uh, that we like very much. Um, that's also very, become very popular in Japan. But one of the many surprising sushi facts in the book as the story goes through is you realize tuna, A, tuna was not even considered a traditional sushi fish at all. In fact, the Japanese for decades and decades and decades considered it a garbage fish. And it wasn't until after World War II they started eating a more westernized diet, uh, American influence, more red meat, more fatty meats, more beef, then they also started eating more red tuna and sushi. So, um, it's, and the fatty cuts especially were actually, the fishmongers would cut off the fatty belly, you know, that we now pay $60 a pound for and throw it to the cats as a snack. And of course, so, you know, cuisine is always changing, the history of food is a endless history of change. But the fact is, um, a lot of the, the subtler flavored fishes, the lighter fishes, are, were the traditional you know, kings of the sushi bar. They were the, the special fish. And the tuna was more like, you know, too strong, too oily, like more, more, uh, more of a late, a late comer to the whole game. And, um, oh, I've got to take it up. Um, and part of the problem we're having now, as some of you may have read in the news, is that uh, the, the best tuna, the bluefin tuna in particular, are becoming overfished. And that's partly the result of, of too much consumption of sushi. So the, the little take-home message I like to give people in addition to the tips for the sushi bar and how to impress your date is also that by eating a more traditional sushi meal with some of those other types of fish, smaller fish, leaner fish, it's actually a more environmentally friendly meal at the same time. So you're actually getting like, you know, authenticity bonus points and, and his, you know, his history points, but you're also getting very modern points for being a more sustainable consumer. Uh, and on, on that, the one other thing that I've done recently I wanted to share with you, and I brought a bunch of these, uh, I just collaborated with the Blue Ocean Institute, a, uh, a uh, marine uh, conservation organization, to create an ocean-friendly guide to sushi. So we have these up here, too, if you want to take one home, they're free. Um, it's a pull-out guide, and it's got specific fish listed, so like you look up bluefin tuna, and of course you get a big red mark, endangered, this fish is badly overfished now. But then the green ones are all these other suggestions that are actually, many of them, more traditional sushi topics that we just don't see as much in the U.S. Uh, and that's on one side, and then on the other side, uh, these are similar, my sushi bar, you know, eating tips and how they can actually uh, be an environmentally friendly thing as well. 
Oh, uh, and then a history of sushi by a collaborator and colleague of mine, cookbook author who wrote the cookbook. So we're very proud of this uh, little fold-up guide that you can take with you, keep it in your wallet or whatever. So take one of these before you go too. So I'll uh, I'll wrap it up there, um, and I 